Developing Asia is enjoying solid economic growth. Healthy domestic demand, stable financial conditions, and resilient service sectors supported growth in the first half of 2023. After rising sharply last year, inflation is now on the decline in most of the region. After collapsing during the COVID-19 pandemic, tourism is bouncing back in many economies. Money transfers to the region remain strong. ADB forecasts 4.7% GDP growth for developing Asia this year and 4.8% next year. The growth forecast for the People's Republic of China is lowered to 4.9% this year and retained at 4.5% next year. India's growth is forecast at 6.3% this year and 6.7% next year, driven by strong investment and consumption. Inflation in developing Asia is expected to decline to 3.6% this year and 3.5% next year amid falling food and energy prices. However, developing Asia's outlook is subject to several risks. One major risk is the possibility of further weakness in the property sector in the People's Republic of China. Meanwhile, El Niño is increasing the risk of flooding and droughts, which may challenge food security. Policymakers need to keep a close watch on inflation and take measures to protect food security. Governments also need to be vigilant in addressing financial vulnerabilities amid higher interest rates. Hello everyone and welcome to the Asian Impact Webinar for the launch of the Asian Development Outlook uh, 2023. My name is Madhavi Pandit and I am a Senior Economist at the Asian Development Bank. I would like to invite Irfan Qureshi of the Economic Research and Regional Co um, De Development Impact Department to first make the presentation. Over to you, Irfan. Thanks, uh, Madhavi and uh, good day everyone. Let me start by presenting the key messages from the outlook. So the first key message from our presentation and from the report is that growth in the region in the first half of the year remained resilient, driven by healthy domestic demand, rebounding tourism, strong remittances, improving financial conditions, and reopening in the People's Republic of China. Weak global demand is depressing exports and weaknesses in the PRC's property sector is slowing growth there with repercussions for the region. Growth in developing Asia is projected to rise from 4.3% in 2022 to 4.7% in 2023, which is a marginal downward revision from our April forecast. The growth forecast is maintained at 4.8% in 2024. Inflation is projected to continue declining towards levels we saw prior to the pandemic from 4.4% in 2022 to 3.6% this year and 3.5% next year. Risks to the outlook have intensified recently, with weaknesses in the PRC's property sector being an important contributor. Other risks include elevated financial stability risks, climate change including the effects of the El Nino, and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Let me now elaborate on these points. In the first half of 2023, the region's growth accelerated to 5.1% compared to 3.9% in the second half of last year. This can be seen from the two bars on the left. It is mostly driven by domestic consumption, shown in navy blue, while net exports in light blue contributed negatively. Similar patterns hold when you look at developing Asia, excluding PRC. But there is variation across economies. Let me walk you through a few economies, starting from the left-hand side. The PRC's reopening was an important contributor to developing Asia's first half growth. 
growth almost doubled there in the first half of this year as consumption recovered after the zero COVID policy was abandoned. Another source of growth was India, where total investment, which you can see in light green, was robust. Worsening net exports put downward pressure on growth in Taipei, China, and Republic of Korea. Finally, in most ASEAN four economies, which you can see from the last portion of this chart, domestic demand slowed earlier this year as the boost from reopening last year fades. Uh, growth, uh, growth rates still remain relatively strong thanks to domestic consumption and investment. Let me now expand a bit on the industrial and services sector. There are several important messages from this slide. Let me start from the left-hand side chart, which shows growth in industrial production. In some regional economies, such as Philippines and India at the top portion, industrial production remained quite strong. But weak external demand held back industrial production in Taipei, China and Singapore, primarily due to prolonged soft demand for electronics. You can see these at the bottom of this chart. In the Republic of Korea and Vietnam, the fall in industrial production has slowed, and we see signs of a recovery. This is particularly true for industrial production in Vietnam, which you can see in the orange line, where it returned to the positive year-on-year -year growth in the latest reading in July. Moving on to the right-hand side chart, uh, manufacturing purchasing managers index uh, reading suggests divergence amongst economy. Starting from the top and looking at the latest readings for July and August, in India and Indonesia, PMIs remained above 50, reflecting strong manufacturing activity. PMIs also improved into expansionary territory in August for the PRC in Vietnam, while it declined in the Philippines and Thailand. PMIs have remained below 50 for Taipei, China, Malaysia, and Korea since the beginning of this year. Let me end this slide by talking about the service sector. PMIs for services in PRC in India remain above 50 since the beginning of this year, suggesting a robust demand for services. In the report, our supply side breakdown of GDP growth points to service sector being a major driver of growth in many economies. The report digs a bit deeper on the external sector. Broadly, what we see is that this year has seen weaker external demand compared to last year. But there are some silver lines. Starting from the left-hand side chart, uh, the left-hand side cho chart shows the evolution of nominal exports of goods from the region. Regional exports have started to stabilize following a decline from the peaks reached last year. This is particularly the case for the high income tech exporters, which benefited the most from the surge in demand for electronics during the pandemic. In contrast, the PRC has seen exports slow down in recent months after a strong start to the year. A similar deceleration is happening to exports from South Asia and Southeast Asia, while exports from Caucasus and Central Asia and from the Pacific appear to have reached their peaks earlier this year. The right-hand side chart shows the decomposition of the declines in exports by product. The green bars show that lower demand for machinery and electrical equipment, which includes electronics, was the main contributor to declines in exports from East Asia and Southeast Asia. In contrast, Cambodia and India increased their exports of electrical components. Declining demand for textiles and footwear depicted in the yellow bars also significantly impacted the exports of garment exporters such as Cambodia and Vietnam. As I pointed out in the first slide, there is a rebound in tourism and a healthy flow of money transfers to the region. The left-hand side chart shows international tourist arrivals to the region. On average, international arrivals were 50% of the pre-pandemic average by the end of 2022 and are now close to 70% in the year today. Tourism-dependent economies in the Pacific and South Asia recovered the most, and arrivals are now back to pre-pandemic levels for the Maldives, Armenia, and Fiji. Economies in East and Southeast Asia are still lagging, but are on a similar trajectory in the recovery of the tourism sector. The right-hand side chart shows the evolution of net personal transfers to the region. Panel A shows economies with a traditional outbound flow of migrant workers, where transfers remained at a higher level than pre-pandemic for most economies. Remittances to Pacific economies are on a positive trend due to the reopening of borders and greater migration to Australia and New Zealand. Panel B shows that transfers to the Caucasus and Central Asia started to decline from the high levels reached in 2022, although those, uh, these flows are still high. These are mostly transfers of savings reflecting inflows of Russian migrants to the region since the start of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Moving on to inflation, 
The left-hand side chart shows average inflation in 2023 in the filled diamonds, while the hollow diamonds show the highest inflation reading since 2021. Finally, the black bars denote the inflation target of central bank. The economies are ordered by the size of the gap between inflation and the targets, with the ones with the large gaps towards the left of the chart. We see that there are some economies still facing double-digit inflation, such as Pakistan, with inflation still considerably above target. Sri Lanka's average inflation has also been high, but it masks the sharp drop in inflation this year with the latest reading at just 4% in August. Inflation has also declined in other, other countries and is now within or close to target for several economies. In the right-hand side figure, we plot the monthly breakdown of monetary policy decisions. The red bars show the number of hikes, yellow bars show decisions to hold, and green bars show decisions to cut interest rates. With inflation slowing, some central banks have started to loosen policy, as we have seen 10 cuts this uh, already this year, notably in the PRC, Sri Lanka, and some economies in the Caucasus and Central Asia. In other economies, inflation has declined, but remains higher than normal. As a result, central banks in these economies have held policy rates at current levels. After a rough start to the year in the next slide, financial markets, financial market conditions have improved. The VIX index, which you can see in the black line in the left-hand side chart, which is an indicator of uncertainty and risk aversion, has declined largely since April, signaling less risk aversion, although there is some upward movement lately reflecting the possibility of interest rates being higher for long. The chart also shows that equity markets in developing Asia, which you can see in blue, and in the US in the green line. And what you can see from this chart is that they have recovered steadily since March when banking turmoil in the US and Europe roiled financial markets. Markets climbed gradually as investor sentiment improved due to better than expected economic conditions and the possibility of less hawkish monetary policy in the US during this period. On the right-hand side chart, you can see that currencies in the region depreciated only marginally with a GDP-weighted average of 3.7% on a year-to-date basis. Among the outliers, the Pakistani rupee experienced a significant depreciation because of worsening macroeconomic conditions. In the report itself, we also note the narrowing of risk premiums and uh, more portfolio inflows in the region. Let me now move on to the baseline assumptions that underpin the outlook. Starting with the G3 economy, what we see from this table is that the G3 economies are slowing, but less sharply than what we expected at the start of the year. Oil prices were down in the first half of the year on slowing global demand, though they have rebounded since July following output cuts by OPEC Plus members. This is prompting a downward revision to $83 per barrel on average for this year. Crucially for the region, rice prices have shot up to 15-year high as India has expanded restrictions to rice exports. This, this export curve follows uh, erratic monsoon rainfall, and it happens in the context of El Nino, something I highlighted earlier, which is expected to result in drier uh, weather and hurt the monsoon harvest in Southeast Asia as well. India's export curve contributed to rising prices to the rest of the region, as India accounts for 40% of globally traded price. This increases the risk that other regional exporters like Thailand, Vietnam, and Pakistan also restrict ex exports. This would raise food security challenges for rice importers, including Bangladesh, Bhutan, Maldives, Nepal, and the Philippines. The good news is that wheat prices remain in check despite Russia's withdrawal from the Black Sea Grain Initiative in July. Let me now present the outlook and risks for the region. As you can see from the first three bars on the left, GDP growth in developing Asia is projected to return gradually to pre-pandemic rates. We are seeing growth converging in all sub-regions toward their respective pre-pandemic rates as the different timings of COVID-19 outbursts, vaccinations, and reop reopenings no longer drive the outlook. Coxes in Central Asia and East Asia are exceptions to those trends, and I'll discuss why next. Moving on to the right-hand side table, growth in the Coxes in Central Asia is receding from last year's unexpected high growth, but it continues to hold up better than expected. This is driven by a fiscal stimulus in Kazakhstan and resilient flows of visitor and money, visitors and money from the Russian Federation. In East Asia for China, we're lowering our forecast from 4.9%. We are lowering our forecast to 4.9% from 5% in April. Even as services have supported growth in the first half of the year, 
the contraction in real estate investment and headwinds for manufacturing are expected to continue in the second half of the year. For the Republic of Korea and Taipei, China, we're more bearish than we were in April as electronic exports uh, keep contracting. In Southeast, in South Asia, for India, we expect growth to remain strong at 6.3%, driven by private consumption and investment. The 6.3% forecast is slightly lower than our earlier forecast, as erratic rainfall during the monsoon will dent harvest. We're slightly lowering our forecast for Southeast Asia, which is being affected from slowing demand for manufactured goods as global consumption is increasingly geared towards services. And in the Pacific, tourism is rebounding stronger than expected while infrastructure projects are resuming, which is further boosting growth. Regarding inflation, the chart on the left side shows that in developing Asia, excluding China, the slowdown in inflation is driven by energy prices, which you can see in gray, and food prices in orange. But importantly, we're also seeing coal inflation receding in yellow. Despite the slowdown in coal inflation, headline inflation is expected to remain above 6% this year in developing Asia, excluding China, which is still twice higher than pre-pandemic rates. The chart in the middle shows that in China, inflation fell through the first half of the year to become negative in July. This is prompting a revision to our inflation forecast for this year, which is now 0.7%. This is driven by the slowdown in China, but also largely by food prices coming down notably as pork production normalizes. Given the temporary nature of the shock, we think disinflation is less of a risk in China. And for next year, we expect inflation to bounce back to 2%. On the right-hand side chart, you can see that we expect inflation to keep coming down in all other subregions and to converge to pre-pandemic rates next year. As I mentioned earlier, Risks to the outlook have intensified in recent weeks. The PRC's property market woes have largely eliminated any upside risks there. And we, in the report itself, we have a special topic that looks at this risk in greater detail. The next slide, please. So we rely, for this special topic, we rely on input-output tables to capture the effects of a further property market weakening on other sectors and, trade, and through trade linkages. For instance, a decline in construction investment implies lower demand for the raw materials or inputs used, transport services and finance, both sourced from within the country and from trading partners. Specifically, we quantify the impact of a 10% reduction in real estate investment in the PRC, combined with a 1% reduction in consumption due to wealth effects and a 1% reduction in investment due to lower business confidence. This scenario would constitute a significant drag on, G on PRC growth to which authorities would be expected to respond. The special topic evaluates two policy scenarios. Under a moderate policy response, the decline in real estate investment, private consumption, and private investment is cut by half through a combination of measures directed at the property sector, plus broader fiscal and monetary easing. In this scenario, GDP in the PRC falls by 0.6% with respect to the baseline. Under a strong policy response, the declines are cut by half again, and total fiscal easing amounts to 1% of GDP. With a stronger policy response, output can even increase by 0.4 percentage points relative to the baseline. Both policy responses are well within the policy space available to policymakers in China based on their past responses to economic downturns. The impact on the rest of the region is very limited. This reflects the fact that most of the inputs used in real estate construction in the PRC are domestically sourced. However, there is some variation across economies. Mongolia, whose coal exports are an important part of the trade with the PRC, and Taipei, China, who is an important trading partner in electronics and manufacturing, would experience more sizable effects. Let me conclude my presentation by discussing the other risks to the outlook. High interest rates are keeping financial stability risks elevated, whether from vulnerable sovereigns or potential renewal of banking turmoil. Despite the fall in global food prices from its 2022 peaks, food security will continue to be challenged by the effects of El Nino, sporadic food, food supply disruptions from the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and restrictions on food exports by some economies. Other challenges, including the escalation of Russian invasion of Ukraine, Factoring of global production, which will affect trade, employment, and productivity. Finally, inflation dynamics and the stance of monetary policy in advanced economies will also shape the global outlook over the forecast horizon. 
even as inflation comes down in the US, it is above target. Interest rates could rise further and stay higher for longer if, if the economy continues to surprise on the upside and inflation remains above target. That concludes my presentation. Uh, back to you, Madhavi. Thank you, Irfan, for a stimulating presentation on the outlook for Asia and the Pacific. The report is available online for your reference. For a deeper discussion on the drivers of economic growth and inflation, the key risks weighing on the region's outlook, and insights on policy responses to ongoing challenges, we have a group of expert panelists with us today. It gives me pleasure to introduce from the Economic Research and Development Impact Department, Rana Hassan, Regional Lead Economist and South Asia Expert, uh, Mar Maria Karina Tinio, Associate Economics Officer and Pacific Expert, from the East Asia Department, Yotin Jinjarak, Senior Economist, from Central and West Asia Department, Lilia Alexanian, and from the Southeast Asia Department, Senior Regional Cooperation Officer, Dulce Zara. So I will kickstart today's discussion with a few questions for our panelists. The audience is invited to submit their questions in the Q&A box, or if you like some questions that are posted in the box, please hit the thumbs up button and I will raise them with the panelists. Okay, so let's begin with some of the hot issues. On China, Yotin, the ADB has revised down growth in China to 4.9% from April's forecast of 5%. Does the 10 basis points revision fully capture the dynamics we are observing both within China and globally? Uh, thank you, Madhavita. So the, a lot has changed uh, since the April. The, back in April, we uh, uh, forecast uh, the growth for China at 5.0%. Uh, now, between April uh, and uh, July and August, um, uh, we also noted that um, uh, there's a weakening in the export growth, um, and also there's an ongoing correction in the property markets. So the, the weakening in the export growth uh, uh, went beyond what we expected. Uh, so for the first eight months, uh, the export growth uh, in China uh, declined by the uh, minus 5%. Now, the silver lining is that uh, uh, we may recall that in July, there was even the uh, significant drop in the export growth, um, minus 14%. But in August, um, that decline has narrowed uh, to uh, minus 8%. Uh, so the decline has narrowed, uh, suggesting that there's some uh, bottoming out in the export uh, um, the decline. Uh, at the same time, we also noticed that uh, although between the April uh, to uh, July and August, um, uh, there's an ongoing correction in the property market. But at the same time, the, the government has rolled out a number of uh, policy responses, um, which is now uh, taking the, its effects. Um, so the, taking into account uh, what happened uh, between the uh, April and uh, uh, what we are now the, in the September, um, both uh, 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 export uh, adjustment and also property market correction and the policy responses, uh, we adjust the, our growth forecast downward uh, from 5.0% uh, uh, to 4.9%. Uh, um, but we keep the growth for next year at 4.5%. Uh, uh, so uh, we think that uh, that uh, fully capture uh, the dynamics of uh, uh, the Chinese economy um, for this year. Back Thank you, you Yotin. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I will keep you for a moment longer because there's a question here from Ellen Zhang from Reuters. I think it's based on a remark made by uh, the managing director of the IMF. So I will read this question to you. Does ADB agree with IMF's push that China should shift its growth model towards more domestic consumption? Or would you say more fiscal stimulus is the way forward? And if so, what type of stimulus? Is it an infrastructure push or welfare improvement or something else? Okay. Um, thanks, Mahalui. That's, that's a good question. Um, good and timely questions. Um, so the, as the 
household of uh, household income in China um, uh, increased, uh, uh, consumption will become the more important uh, to GDP growth in the China, um, and, and that is a pattern that we observed uh, in other advanced economy. As income increased, uh, consumption growth become the uh, more important to the GDP growth. Um, and uh, if you look at the data, um, the consumption, the household expenditures the, uh, in China is the below 40% of uh, GDP. Uh, now, if you look across uh, the economies, the, the, the average, the global average um, is the, about uh, 50%. The EU average household uh, expenditure to GDP is about 50%. Um, for the U.S., the, the household expenditure uh, is the above the 60% um, of, of GDP. So that means that there is a room, a headroom for the uh, uh, consumption, domestic consumption in China that to grow further. Um, but at the same time, uh, I think we should recognize that um, uh, consumption, domestic consumption or private consumption in particular, is only one part of uh, the growth equations. Uh, productivity growth is also very important uh, to the Chinese economy. Uh, after all, the level of uh, capital accumulation in China uh, is still below uh, that of the level in the advanced economies. So that means that there's a room for um, uh, capital, both uh, public capital and uh, private capital to, uh, to grow further uh, in, in China, which in turn would uh, contribute to the growth and productivity um, uh, in, in China. Um, and uh, the growth in the uh, productivity um, in some sectors the, could also be the basis for the domestic consumption. Uh, for example, uh, China has made uh, headways uh, in several sectors, um, AI, um, uh, renewables, um, electric vehicles, uh, among others. And, and this could be the basis for the domestic consum uh, con consumption growth uh, in, in China. Um, and we also see that uh, the Chinese government um, uh, has to provide uh, support uh, to stimulate uh, domestic consumption uh, in, in this area. Um, for example, in the past few months, um, uh, we noted that um, government has rolled out policy support um, to boost uh, the adoption of uh, electric vehicles in the rural areas um, in the form of tax break, um, uh, so, so, so that is the one way to think about how to the, promote both uh, domestic consumption and also boost um, uh, productivity and uh, um, innovation in the key sector at the same time. So I think the, the, to answer that question, the, um, a long story short, I think both consumption and uh, investment uh, uh, to boost productivity and innovation uh, uh, are both uh, important. And, uh, uh, the Chinese uh, economy uh, could still go about uh, supporting both. Let me stop here, Madhavi. Thanks. Thank you, Yotin. Very clear. Uh, let me now uh, talk about another major economy in the region and invite Rana to discuss a little bit about what is driving dynamism in India's investment and will it last? Um, thank you, Madhavi. So, um, essentially, uh, we, we think the, the answer to this is yes. And uh, we see gross fixed capital formation growing by about 8% or more in the last uh, um, uh, five quarters. Now, this has been driven in a, a big way by uh, the central government. Uh, we've seen central government um, uh, target growth in investments of about uh, 35%. Uh, and what's interesting in this latest quarter for the fiscal year, the data that's come out is uh, that state governments are also ramping up. Uh, in fact, they've shown investment growth of about 74%. Um, so overall, you see uh, about 5.4% of GDP in quarter one was driven by uh, capital expenditure by the government. Now, what we think is very important about this is uh, this is really expanding the productive capacity of of, of the country. It's it's a, a lot of it is uh, 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 in infrastructure, and we believe that it would be uh, crowding in private capital. Now, um, let me move to the private capital side and why why we are optimistic on that. Uh, first of all, we're seeing bank credit uh, uh, growing. Uh, it's it's uh, it's it's grown about nineteen uh, percent. Uh, 
um, in, in, in the first quarter. Uh, we see non-performing loans in the banking sector falling to below 4% of total assets. Uh, we see corporate balance sheets have gotten deleveraged. Uh, we see capacity utilization rates improving in, in several uh, industries. Um, and, and finally, we're seeing a, a better policy environment, for example, in the uh, manufacturing sector. So these these things give us uh, a, a sense that we should be uh, at a stage where private investment, uh, especially in manufacturing, is also going to uh, kick up, also in services. Uh, things to watch out for, of course, uh, there's the shocks from the uh, uh, you know the global economic environment, and um, if interest rates increase further, if if wholesale price inflation starts. Uh, uh, heading to uh, um, uh, higher levels, then yes, the real cost of credit might come in, and that's where we see uh, the risk. Thank you. Thank you, Rana. I'm also going to tap you for um, your thoughts on the issue of debt. Well, in general, in South Asian countries, given the experience with Sri Lanka in the past and now in the Maldives, there's a question in the chat here that uh, asks about uh, what is the debt situation in Maldives in the outlook? Right. So um, it, it's a very good question. And we do see, uh, uh, you know, we, we had a IMF uh, article for uh, uh, um, report of 2022, uh, which did mention that Maldives um, uh, was at a risk of external debt distress. Um, so what, what this has done, though, is it's prompted the government to start implementing um, uh, a, a reform agenda to tackle both fiscal imbalances, which, which are the uh, driver of, of this debt, and, and the debt itself. Um, now, you know, the, the pathway to debt sustainability, um, let, let me just briefly split it into, you know, medium term, long term. Uh, it's it's essentially going to require uh, strengthening domestic resource mobilization. It's going to require uh, expenditure efficiency and, and better management of the debt. Um, you know, a couple of things uh, I, I can mention is that ADB has been supporting a tax administration diagnostic um, and, and helping the Maldives develop a medium term revenue strategy. Um, and, and some of the things we think should be uh, considered are, um, uh, you know, impose a GST on imports at customs, formalize, uh, raise excise taxes. Um, we think personal income tax rates need to be revised to become more progressive. Um, and um, we, we also think there's scope to streamline large expenditures. Uh, so, for example, when you have these big uh, public investment programs, um, these should be systematically programmed, uh, prioritized. Um, there's also several state-funded pension schemes under various different types of laws and regulations. They tend to be outside of the Pension Act, and harmonizing these to remove duplication uh, would, would be something that uh, um, would streamline costs. Um, and, and finally, uh, just uh, as I'd mentioned earlier, uh, debt, debt management uh, uh, needs to be strengthened. And by this, uh, what we're talking about is undertake cost risk analysis of borrowing decisions, uh, restructure existing high cost debt uh, uh, to the extent possible to reduce fiscal risk. Thanks, Madhvi. Thank you, Rana. I want to talk a bit about challenges that the region is facing um, and that the challenges that governments need to be vigilant about, for example, food security. Dulce, um, perhaps you can talk a little bit about what will be the impact of droughts and floods caused by El Nino on Southeast Asian economies and what can policymakers do? Thanks, Madhavi. Um, okay, for uh, El Nino, depending on how or the, the the effect, how big the effect of El Nino will be in Southeast Asia, agricultural production is likely to get hit, particularly in the most vulnerable countries to extreme weather events such as Indonesia, the Philippines, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam. Now, um, we've already heard earlier um, weather disturbances have led India to ban rice import exports to ensure food security. Now, since India accounts 40% of global rice trade, rice importers, importers from Southeast Asia may be affected by reduced supply. As we have seen international rice prices go up by as much as 19% in the first seven months of this year. So although inflation has moderated in the first seven months of the year, um, Food inflation, sorry, uh, food inflation remained elevated 
and that is above 5% for countries like the Lao PDR, the Philippines, Singapore, and Malaysia. So reduced agriculture uh, output, both domestically and uh, globally, will be harmful for these economies and the smaller economies, uh, particularly Lao, PDR, and Timor-Leste. Now, another impact would be the scarcity of water. So um, it, the El Nino can affect the water flowing into basins um, and affecting hydropower. So this can affect power supply um, and um, affecting industry activity as well, disrupting supply chains, and which can stoke inflation. Now, what can governments do? Um, given the warning um, by the World Meteorological Organization, governments by now should be uh, mobilizing preparations to limit the impact of El Nino on our health, ecosystems, and our economies. Um, strong coordination among various agencies in charge of health, agriculture, infrastructure, disaster prevention response, budget finance, together with local governments and the private sector, is key in protecting the most vulnerable groups. Making sure steady supply of inputs to agriculture production or augmenting supply through imports and ensuring access to finance for our farmers and uh, the firms engaged in agriculture production. Second is regional cooperation is also vital. I've mentioned earlier that some countries may not be as vulnerable as the others. So cooperation can ensure food and other inputs to agri-production will be provided to those that will be greatly affected by El Nino. Now, some of the policy recommendations um, can include um, providing temporary income transfers to targeted beneficiaries and that some of our economies have already started this last year because of uh, rising oil prices and food prices. So governments can continue with that, but targeting um, the, the most vulnerable sectors of the population. Now, the other one is to build networks that would reduce farm to market costs in order to reduce the divide between the rural and the urban. The third, another one would be innovating food systems that will sustainably produce more, but with less resources to address insufficient food supply and malnutrition. And finally, promoting and investing in agricultural processes that are sustainable and resilient, and also innovations uh, such as um, digitalizing the agriculture food chains will be very helpful in the long run. Thank you, Madavi. Thank you, Dulce. Um, let me invite Irfan back on the screen and ask him about um, what are the trends expected for exchange rates in the region? And there are a couple of specific questions on the Philippines peso as well as the Indonesian rupiah. Perhaps you can give us some idea about exchange rates in general? Uh, sure, Madhavi, thanks. So in the report itself, uh, we do not forecast exchange rates per se, but I can talk about the broader trends. And what you've seen this year is that currencies have only depreciated marginally in the region. Actually, if you take a GDP-weighted average of currencies in developing Asia, the decline has been below 4% on a year-to-date basis. And it's important to contextualize this compared to last year. So broadly speaking, currencies depreciated last year on account of aggressive uh, Federal Reserve uh, policy and the hikes that we saw. Um, and the other weaknesses that specifically we saw last year were driven by economy specific factors, and some of them have spilled over this year. For instance, um, I mentioned among the outliers uh, this year, the Pakistani rupee experienced a significant depreciation, and that was account of you know country specific factors, weaker macro conditions. So, in in that sense, um, exchange rates this year have broadly been very stable. Generally, back to you, man. Thank you. Thank you, Irfan. Um, let's move on to another hot issue, which is that it's been more than a year and a half after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and the war still remains a major source of uncertainty for the region. For the Caucasus and Central Asia, Lilia, 
can you talk a little bit about um, what you see as some of the risks to the outlook in this subregion? I believe this year growth is set to moderate. Thank you, Madhavi. And uh, so, yeah, as you, as Irfan also mentioned in his presentation, in 2022, the sub-regional growth in the Caucasus and Central Asia was remarkably strong. And the special topic was included in April edition of ADO to explore the reasons behind this unexpected performance. And uh, so I invite uh, uh, participants to look into that report for more details. But in a nutshell, the story behind the main spillovers from the Russian invasion of Ukraine were relinked to large inflows of income, capital migrants from Russia, and notably to Georgia, Armenia, the Kyrgyz Republic, Uzbekistan, etc. But there was also increased transit trade that affected growth positively in 2022. Now, we and many others uh, had predicted that these are only short-term benefits and they will start, subside, um, uh, uh, start subsiding in 2023, so this year, so because the external shock will gradually taper. So, so far, uh, we in uh, the outlook, however, looks a little bit different. This is one of the reasons we have revised upwards growth projections for some of countries of the region, notably in Armenia and Georgia, because the, the growth momentum has continued, helped by, as also Irfan mentioned, continued robust tourism, continued financial inflows, and also transit trade. So consumption and investment are still keeping growth strong, uh, although, uh, uh, as you mentioned, uh, this will be less than last year. So that's the reason of the slowdown. Now the main question is um, not only for uh, us, for everyone is, will this be a persistent benefit, persistent effect uh, spillover uh, to the region? So we don't have the answer on that question, but because uncertainty is very high and we are actively monitoring data because and the uncertainty is mainly, mainly linked to what will be the uh, uh, outlook, the the of external flows and also the global and regional uh, uh, conjunctures. So on the upside risk side, if the higher export risk and capital and migrant influence remain significant, so this is a significant upside risk for the for the region. And uh, also uh, if in the long term, it, if these inflows continue as a greater investment and productivity growth, so we can expect that for CCI countries that can raise the long-term growth trajectory. However, as you mentioned in your question, there are risks, and we, our country chapters are uh, discussing it uh, in detail. Um, we, the risks are mostly from the spillovers from the war in Ukraine. They could escalate through trade, foreign investment, exchange rate channels, and also secondary sanctions if imposed on domestic uh, entities. So that could affect domestic and international investor confidence. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Lilia, I will direct one more question at you, which is how the recent development in global oil markets reflect on the outlook of the Caucasian and Central Asian countries? So, yeah, the outlook uh, on oil outlook was one of the main factors that uh, impacted uh, uh, growth performance, mostly in oil exporting countries of the region, uh, Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan. So in 2022, as you know, higher energy commodity prices, they contributed positively and improved external balances in these countries. But uh, this year and also the forecast for next year is, uh, so the decline in all the oil prices is that they, it will weaken uh, current account balance. So I will say a couple of words on Kazakhstan specifically uh, uh, because uh, there were in April, there were oil cuts by OPEC, but that did not affect Kazakhstan, which has been increasing oil production since March. And this, it is still re, uh, below the quota uh, uh, defined by OPEC. So what happened, uh, Kazakhstan increased a lot its oil production, but uh, because of lower oil prices, this is uh, uh, something that will weigh on their external account. And in the case of Azerbaijan, the storyline is a little bit different. We have, as you saw in the report, uh, uh, we have revised downwards gross projection for Azerbaijan. And the main reason is, again, a story behind oil production. Uh, but in this, in this, in the context of Azerbaijan, oil production is declining. So there are cuts uh, and it waits on gross outlook. There are also weaker performance in hydrocarbons, despite increasing uh, 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 Gas, gas production. So this is uh, the, so, so this is the two countries that will be affected by oil price and production developments. Thank you.
Thank you, Lilia. There is one more subregion we should cover, so let me invite Kara. Uh, the latest ADO noted how strong uh, the remittances are to the Pacific, but there is a flip side, namely that they partly reflect a sharply increasing labor migration to Australia and New Zealand. Can you talk a little bit about these recent, uh, recent migration trends, what they mean for long-term prospects, and what policymakers should do if it is an issue? Okay, thank you, Madavi. Um, well, as you mentioned, uh, we we have observed a sharp increase in labor migrants, especially to Australia and New Zealand. Um, this was driven by economic slowdown at home uh, during recent years, so uh, partly driven by the, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, as well as increased demand for labor abroad. So in the from 2019 to 2022, uh, there was an a 141.5 increase in approvals uh, of work visas to Australia and New Zealand. Um, and we note quite strikingly, uh, Australian approvals in the first half of this year were greater uh, by about 14% than approvals for all of 2022. Um, there are already concerns about growing scarcity of labor in critical sectors, so uh, including agriculture, construction, healthcare, tourism. Um, the expansion of labor mobility schemes would likely constrain local supply further, uh, and you know, of course, uh, that that would slow down these these growth engines, these critical sectors that I mentioned earlier. It may also require greater dependence on migrant workers to help drive growth. In, in, these, in, in our labor exporting Pacific economies. Um, among the policy responses that, uh, that come to mind are first to make sure that there is an ample supply of labor uh, that's to fill the needs at home as well as to send abroad. Because um, as, as you mentioned, uh, there have been strong remittances to the Pacific. It's been helpful in cushioning the impacts of, of the pandemic and, and uh, you know, governments do recognize that these are uh, important also to 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 the local economy. Um, so uh, again, building this building the supply of labor that does entail uh, measures including supporting the increased labor participation of youth and women, um, tailoring your domestic skills training programs to fit local employers' needs, providing employment pathways through apprenticeships and placement programs, uh, things that will help um, make domestic employment more viable as an option to, to a Pacific worker. Thank you. Thank you, Kara. There are a couple of questions uh, in the chat, specifically on Southeast Asian economies. So let me invite Dulce back. Dulce, can you talk a little bit on the outlook for the Philippines in terms of what are the drive, uh, uh, drivers of the growth forecast and also for Indonesia in the context of the upcoming elections? Okay, um, for the Philippines, we have downgraded our forecast for this year. Um, this is mainly due to the uh, um, weakening in domestic demand. You know, we're, if we're comparing it with the last year's performance, with the reopening of the economy, so that, that there, were, there was um, pent up demand, the so consumption was very high, and there was also elections last year, so in, um, fiscal or spending investment was also high. So this year um, they have gone down. Um, but then, and, and another factor is the decline in exports. So that that's the the reason for the downgrade. But moving forward, we are positive. Uh, pros prospects really uh, remain positive for the Philippines. Uh, we are uh, looking at investments from the government, given its pipeline of infrastructure projects, and as well as con um, co uh, continued consumer spending which is the, the main driver of growth for the Philippines. Uh, for Indonesia, we are expecting uh, a boost to the economy uh, given the, the elections next year. So except for the, for the rest of the, most of the economies were downgraded for their growth forecast, but Indonesia and Thailand and uh, remain strong for next year this year and next year. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dulce. There are several questions on inflation, and I think many of our panelists can come in, in the sense that we are seeing moderation overall, but there is heterogeneity across countries and sub-regions. Uh, let me first invite Rana to talk about uh, India, which may be bucking the trend. Uh, thanks, uh, Madhavi. In the case of um, India, uh, yes, we have seen uh, a, a spike in inflation. In, in, in July, we, we saw inflation at 7.4%. August, it was 6.8%. It's been led by food prices. And um, in particular, while you know higher vegetable prices have been much publicized, but we've also seen other categories con contributing, uh, cereals, milk, oils, pulses, prices. Now, uh, while some of this is temporary, others reflect concerns of the the, the Kharif crop output, and which is why, uh, if you look at our inflation forecast for uh, the the fiscal year that we're in right now, that will be ending March 2024, we've increased it uh, from five percent uh, back in April to about five point five uh, percent. Now, um, you know, I, I just want to uh, take this opportunity, Madhuri, to just make a make a general point. I think, you know, with uh, climate related risks, we, we see uh, El Nino developing, and we, we're seeing this pattern of um, extreme weather events. I think it's very important. Uh, uh, for countries to really think in terms of uh, you know uh, strategies, uh, you've you've got your short term strategy, your medium term strategy, your long term strategy, and 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 I think uh, 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 to give you a concrete example, you know for the longer term, uh, we we have to Im increase uh, expenditures of R and D uh, in in agriculture. We have to look into things like uh, micro irrigation, drip irrigation, um, you know innovative farm practices, and we have all these digital technologies. We have um, precision agriculture, uh, etc. So I, I think the scope is there, uh, but uh, uh, you know, just uh, broadly uh, broadening from India. You know, if you look at our South Asia Asian Development Outlook update, you will notice that the issue of the erratic monsoon has been a feature um, uh, in a lot of countries. Uh, we've we've seen this uh, in Bhutan. Um, we've seen this in Nepal. Uh, we've seen a very, very dry August in, in the case of India. So this is just, uh, I, I think, a generalized phenomena. Let Thank me stop. you, Rana. Uh, let me invite one more sub-region. Uh, Lilia, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, CCA countries? Yes, thank you, Madhavi. I can say a few words about that. Uh, that it's an, it's a really an important uh, uh, development for the CCA region, as you saw in the chart shared by Irfan. CCA region has the highest inflation rate among all developing Asia countries, and inflation rates are in uh, volatile usually in most CCA economies, mainly due to the fact that the consumption basket includes a, a, a big a big share of food items and also imported products, and uh, what happened last year in 2022, the surge in international food and energy prices were combined with persistent supply chain bottlenecks, and it really showed how the region is vulnerable uh, to inflation jumping to double-digit levels, and they are still a double-digit in some uh, in most of the countries of the region. But what we expect is a deceleration uh, this year and next year, and uh, this is because uh, uh, there are several reasons for that, uh, strong base effects of last year, but also lower imported food prices, appreciation or even stability of local currencies, but also lacked effect of monetary policy uh, uh, tightening. As you know, uh, last year, uh, most CCA bank, central banks have raised interest rates uh, during the surge of inf uh, pri inflation. But what um, uh, at, at this stage, the monetary policies remain still very tight. So the region still faces persistent inflationary pressures despite tightening monetary policies. And of course, it indicates that there are some structural issues uh, with shallow financial markets or reliance on foreign exchange interventions, et cetera. But uh, uh, central banks need to remain vigilant. So only Armenia, Georgia, and Tajik Tajikistan that have recently cut their policy rates. And further, uh, any changes in the policy rate should really depend on the evolution of inflation, and specifically on the evolution of 
core inflation, uh, we should uh, durably fall because it's not, it's also another another issue for CTA countries. It's uh, not only uh, core inflation still re- uh, remains very high, and uh, because of domestic uh, demand pressures. So in in parallel, the governments and central bank they need to put more pressures to develop to improve this uh, pass through mechanism of the monetary policy tightening to the real economy to contain inflationary pressures and also anchor inflationary expectations. Thank you, Madhavi. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Lilia. There is a very popular question here on China's housing market, and um, Yutin, you alluded to it in your initial comments. Perhaps you can talk a little more, bit more about whether the Chinese housing market is at risk and how worried are we about financial fragilities in general? Uh, thank you, Madhavi. The, yeah, indeed, uh, the Chinese housing market is uh, going through a correction. Um, so uh, we may recall that uh, it was just um, uh, three years ago, back in uh, 2021, that uh, the government introduced uh, three red lines uh, to put uh, control or the restrictions on the balance sheet of uh, uh, property developers. Um, and uh, we, we are seeing that um, there are corrections that when we look at uh, the price decline uh, across the major cities, uh, tier one, tier two, and tier three in China. Uh, we see the correction in the decline in the uh, property sales. Um, we also noted that uh, some uh, property developers, uh, they have difficulty uh, finishing the housing projects. Um, some of them also the required a debt uh, restructuring. Now, I think we are um, uh, not thinking about um, housing market uh, at a very high risk um, because so far uh, China uh, does not have uh, 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 the collapse in the housing prices and uh, asset price uh, broad based uh, as we uh, did see um, uh, in the uh, in the past when when we think about uh, uh, the the bust of the housing market in other countries um, there are uh, important reasons for this um, uh, for other countries when they uh, went into the housing market bust um, uh, one of the key reason was the uh, they borrow heavily uh, heavily uh, from overseas um, in the case of China, though, um, the saving rate in China uh, is very high. Uh, at the same time, most of uh, the loans and the lending uh, in China uh, are uh, mostly uh, domestically uh, funded or financed. Um, the banking sector lending, uh, total lending, uh, that uh, goes into the property markets, both uh, uh, to the support uh, uh, the household mortgage and also the property developers, uh, amount to only about uh, a quarter of, uh, of that. Uh, so a quarter of total lending went into the property sector. Um, so we think that uh, the, uh, the financial system in China uh, uh, remain resilient uh, to the uh, property market correction. Uh, there's one area though that we think this is the, a long-term issue that uh, require um, uh, structural adjustment uh, is the, um, the local government finance uh, with respect to the, the property market. Um, as we know, the local government in China depend heavily on the revenue from uh, uh, selling uh, the land usage uh, rights. Um, so a uh, more efficient uh, tax sharing uh, between the, um, the central and the local government such that um, uh, the local government can uh, rely more on their own source revenue, uh, perhaps in the form of uh, 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 property tax. Uh, uh, that, that, that could be good uh, for the, uh, the long-term uh, uh, finance uh, in the Chinese economy. So the bottom line is that uh, the financial sector remains resilient, but uh, um, at, at the same time, we are concerned um, and we think there should be more um, adjustment to the local government finance with respect to the property markets. Let me stop here, Madhavi. Thanks. 
Thank you, Yotin. We have a few more minutes and we could just quickly talk a little bit about another issue that's of interest across the region, which is tourism. Uh, Irfan, could you give us some brief comments on will tourism return to what it looked like pre-pandemic um, or do you see lasting changes? And after Irfan, I'd like Kara to talk a little bit about uh, what it means for the Pacific. Uh, sure, Madhavi. Thanks a lot. So actually, um, in the report itself, we talk about tourism as one of the bright spots in the region. And when you look at the data, what we're seeing is that uh, that compared to pre-pandemic rates, this year, uh, tourism arrivals are now close to 70%. Um, and, you know, the tourism-dependent economies of the Pacific, which Kara will talk about shortly, and South Asia are, uh, are almost back to pre-pandemic levels like Maldives and Armenia and Fiji. Um, so yes, so tourism is is a bright spot in the outlook for sure. Para, thank you, Madavi. Um, thank you, Irfan. So yes, for the Pacific, uh, it is a very significant driver of growth in in a number of our economies. Fiji, as mentioned, Cook Island, Samoa, and Palau. Um, in, in for for the most part, a couple of countries have caught up with their 2019 levels in the space of about one year after reopening. Uh, that would be Fiji and Samoa. Uh, visitor arrivals in the Cooks are catching up. However, uh, those in Palau and Vanuatu remain way below their pre-pandemic levels. Uh, this divergent performance, um, it's it's driven mainly by how easy it was for their respective source markets to resume travel. So. For the cooks for Fiji, for Samoa, it was easier to resume uh, with Asia, uh, sorry, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, Palau source markets are um, in East Asia, Japan, uh, PRC, Republic of Korea, Taipei, China. So um, it, it took a bit more doing, I think, to be able to restore travel connections. Uh, so besides these flight options, another factor that, that plays into the tourism picture is the availability of tourism facilities. So th those were affected by disasters in Vanuatu as well as labor shortages. So uh, the governments are working on on addressing these, um, looking into ways to, to improve uh, the ways of traveling to a destination to provide accommodation and tourism options once they get there in order to sustain demand for tourism um, in, in their uh, tourism to their respective economies. Um, thank you. Thank you, Kara. And it's great to end on that high note because it's the end of the hour. And um, I would like to thank you all for attending today's webinar. If you like this event, the next Asian Impact webinar is on 26th October. 2023, 2 to 3 p.m. Manila time on the topic, Innovative Data for Real-Time Trade Monitoring. A big thank you to all our panelists and uh, participants. Goodbye. <laughs>